Okay, welcome to this presentation on the Viking 22 exercise. My name is Bjorn Lovstrand from Pitch Technologies. And with me today I have Captain Peter Lindskog from the Swedish Armed Forces. He's the uh, uh, CAXCON manager for the Viking ex exercise, who works at the Joint Force Training Center and, uh, in Sweden. And we have Enrico Rao from Massa Group, who is one of the suppliers to this exercise. He will talk more about the specific components that he provided and his company provided. And as I said, my name is Björn Lostrand. I'm uh, supporting the Swedish Defense Material Administration with the integration of the solution for the Viking exercise. So what we'll start off by explaining to you about the exercise itself, and then we will talk about the architecture and design of the system uh, based on standards and uh, some concepts called modeling simulation as a service. So our co core focus for today's presentation is on the MSAS concept and how we applied it in the uh, this exercise. Uh, first off, uh, Peter Linsko will start, and we'll, uh, I'll hand over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, All right, so first of all, I'm going to present uh, what the Viking is for, for a kind of exercise. If you uh, change slide, please. Next one. And next one. So the Viking is um, a continuous exercise and we are executing this exercise every three years and we start in 1999. So we have been conducting nine exercises so far and um, it's really an opportunity for people to come together and train together and that's uh, all of these organizations are contributing to the work and collaborating on, on the work. And we executed this one 20th of March, and we had the XI for two weeks in Sweden. Closer? All right, great. Okay, next one. So, uh, so the main uh, the main thing is that we're going to take the military, civilian, and police together and train them together in a really. Um, high intensity uh, scenario and a uh, really conflict situation that is really reflecting today's conflict arenas. So we are bring those three parties together and train them. And uh, this is also a distributed uh, uh, command post exercise where we have simulators, we have C2 systems, and lots of CAC systems that we call it. And uh, we really offer nations come with their systems, to come with their simulators, to come with their command and control systems. We, we offer them to bring their own device into the exercise. Next one. So there's nearly 2,500 participants. It's nearly people from 50 participating nations, and we have 70 organizations. That is non-governmental organization and governmental organization. And uh, you see lots of the, the, the symbols around this that is showing the, the parties that are, are in the exercise. And this is a really special one. Where we have, if you go to the next one. Uh, so this show the organization. And in this arena we are, we are playing with NATO. So we have three level exercise that we train. We have the N for headquarters. We have the ACC, MCC, LCC, and joint logistics support groups on one level. And we also have the brigades trained. We also can have KOX for the air domain trained in the NATO domain. And then we have also trained UN. And also three level UN uh, organization. And also we have uh, country teams and we also have this civilian organization that is participating here. And what information do we change, exchange between NATO and UN? How do we collaborate? What information can we, can we exchange? How, what can we exchange nine fields and can UN support NATO with other information? That's a really tricky, tricky thing here. And uh, we are about 2,000 uh, staff members that we train, and we are about 500 people that is training them. Okay, next one. So this is a really a distributed exercise. 
Well, we have sites all the way down in Brazil. We have in, uh, in Bulgaria. We have sites in Joint Force Training Center in, in Poland. We have MODs in, in the Netherlands. We have three sites in Sweden. We have one site in, in Finland. We actually have one site, site in, in Qatar as well. And we also had Ukraine here, but something happened in February, so they uh, disappeared from this exercise. But they will always be a part of this exercise. And we are running this from Sweden. And all, my, all my exercise is uh, really distributed. So on every site, we have the training audits. We have brigades on every site there. And the brigades are consisting of all these nations. So all the nations are talking to each other, collaborating, and networking. OK, next one. What about the scenario? So before, we have some scenario called Bogelan scenario, really really peacekeeping scenario. Now we are trying to evolve this one with key teams, themes as uh, military planning, resilience, uh, parallel force, cyber defense, hybrid warfare, and more high intensive war fighting here. And we have a new scenario called Northern Continent scenario. So let us look what uh, the NATO had for kind of mission in this new scenario. So please start to uh, alt -tab. Welcome to this mission. This is your brief on the conflict and current situation in your area of deployment. The northern continent is a geostrategic region rich in natural resources. Currently, it is suffering from violent conflict and humanitarian crises. Oh, there are two. Oh, sir. Okay, Welcome to this mission. This is your brief on the conflict and current situation in your area of deployment. The Northern Continent is a geostrategic region rich in natural resources. Currently, it is suffering from violent conflict and humanitarian crises. There are two regional superpowers, Euroland and Arcticland. These two are competing for influence over their neighbors. Euroland projects power through the promotion of democracy, human rights, and liberal values. This has taken the form of bilateral aid and the signature of trade Southland. Euroland has also encouraged the expansion of NATO. Both Southland and Eastland became members of NATO's Partnership for Peace. Arcticland pushes back against Euroland's expansion, using hard power when necessary. Its strategy is based on a strong politico-military partnership with Westland and the use of hybrid warfare to destabilize its opponents. Arcticland has been a net explorer of oil and gas, and this imbalance has been used to pressure weaker states. In the region, Midland is the poorest country. It is an authoritarian state that suffers from economic mismanagement and corruption. Following a financial crisis and large budget cuts, violence spread in the south of Midland. This led to a bloody civil war to overthrow the government and achieve independence. The civil war raged in the country, leading to tens of thousands of deaths and the displacement of hundreds of thousands of people within Midland and across the region. Under international pressure, a ceasefire agreement was signed and the UN authorized the establishment of the UN mission in Midland. However, as the UN deployed in Midland, the conflict spread to Southland, where historical grievances regarding ethnic inequalities and discrimination escalated into a civil war. Southland is a relatively democratic and stable parliamentary republic. It is a middle-income country with a liberal economy. Southland is populated by two main ethnic groups, Milis living in the north and the Somis living in the south. The Somis live in the economic center of the country and tend to be in positions of power. Milis live in the more remote areas and are disproportionately affected by poverty. The Milis have long felt marginalized by the central government with limited access to social services. They do not feel represented or respected. In 2012, a wave of protests for independence rocked the northern provinces, only to be repressed by the Southlandian army. In turn, Millies organized themselves into self-defense militias. While established for self-protection, the militias were soon accused of assassinations and bombings against government targets, of recruitment, and radicalization of the youth. They received foreign support in the form of training, weapons, and funds. 
Last year, a radical Millie militant assassinated Southland's Prime Minister on his way to work. The government retaliated by launching a large military operation against the Millie militias. The military intervention was seen as an attack on the marginalised Millies. The 5th Brigade in Linchipping, the only brigade in Southland to be staffed by Millies, turned against the government and joined Midlands United Front for Independence. The UFI fought back the government and took control of the province of Ostergotland. They then moved south to capture oil fields. The expansion of UFI in Southland led the international community to deploy a UN-mandated NATO crisis response operation under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. As the NATO forces are pushing northward, UFI forces are being pushed back towards the border area, leading to a cross-border movement of weapons and fighters back into Midland. You are deployed as a part of the NATO peace enforcement mission, and your mission is to assist the government of Southland to establish a safe and secure environment and to protect civilians under imminent threat. This is the mission that they come to. So they will arrive at the staff sites on Monday. Then on Thursday, we start the exercise. And if you go to the next slide. So preparation for this kind of exercise is really long. We have, we've been starting 2020. And uh, we are starting to develop this northern continent scenario already in 2019 or something like that. And so it takes a long time to create those scenarios. But uh, we, have, uh, we are following the, the standard uh, operation on how to proceed, how to plan these kind of exercises. And um, we also, in a technical perspective, follow the engineering process. So in the beginning of the exercise, we are, uh, the exercise is requiring some training objectives that we try to have technical systems to fulfill. And one of these uh, training objectives is that the training audience, all the brigades and so on, all the staffs, should produce a summary reports or summary operational uh, uh, picture. They should monitor the situation in the command and control systems and present the common situation summary. So this is one of the training objectives that the staff should train on. We have no people in the ground, the only staff members, this is, this is a command post exercise. So this is one of the training objectives that we should discuss now. How do we do that? So the next one. So here's an example of the operational pictures, civilian organization, neutral organization, enemy organizations. And we have a complete picture here of uh, uh, operational picture that shows the complete scenario, complete uh, organizations that are involved. So we have nearly like uh, 10,000 units right here, and they could be from company level up to battalion level, what we see here. And uh, the challenge in here, so next one. Okay, so the, the goal is we have simulators in the simulator, why are we running all the things that are meeting, that we're fighting in the simulator, and the results will be transferred to train the audience automatically into the command and control systems. So now we try to figure out how should we stimulate C2 from simulation. Because simulation community of interest are developing their standards, and the C2 systems are developing their standards. Now I'll try to figure out how should we communicate between those, between those systems. Next one. So the challenge in here is that we are offering every nation to bring their system and how can we guarantee that we could fulfill this automatically feeding operational picture? How can we guarantee that? So now we'll hand over the microphone to, to Björn, to FMV, and they could talk more about how should we solve this problem. Thank, thank you, Peter. 
So the, the Swedish Armed Forces and the ranking uh, organization developed these training objectives and uh, requirements on the technical system to support this and challenged uh, the, the providers of the technical solution to, to provide support for doing this simulation to C2 stimulation. So my role in this uh, exercise was to support the Swedish Defense Material Administration who was responsible for delivering this solution to the Swedish Armed Forces. And we took on this challenge to, to uh, extend the existing capability with new additional functions in order to perform this stimulation. So our architecture challenge was to take something that we have in terms of a synthetic environment based on standards of federated systems consisting of a number of simulators and simulation services uh, and our existing C2 environment consisting of multiple C2 systems and bring them together. How do we make them work together seamlessly? How do we automate the process of providing simulation data to the C2 environment in order to support this training objective? So this was our primary challenge for this exercise. We, in previous exercises, we have had other challenges, but for this exercise, this was the key challenge. And we don't want to build something uh, on our own. Uh, not a Swedish specific solution or a Viking specific solution, we want to build it based on, on some sort of standards as well. But there are basically two ways we can go with this specific problem. We can do a specific connector system between a simulator and a specific CETO system or multiple connectors for the different CETO systems like a peer-to-peer -peer integration directly from simula a simulator to a CETO simula system or we can do an approach where we have services that mediates the transfer and, and the flow of information from a, uh, a multiple simulation system to multiple CETO systems. So we have this choice, uh, architectures and design choice, and we went with a simulation services approach because we have multiple simulation systems in the environment. And as Peter said, we are inviting all the participants to bring their own simulation systems. And we have multiple CETO systems and participating nations are allowed to bring their own simulations. And in doing this uh, approach with the C2 mediation services, of course, we need to be basing this on some kind of standards. Otherwise, it's very hard for us to, to manage this situation. And the standards that we are, we are applying uh, in the solution are the NATO standards for modeling and simulation. There is a number of standards and standards uh, that cover different aspects of simulation and C2 interoperability. And we are applying them throughout uh, the design of this solution. And in particular, for this specific problem that we are addressing, where we did not have components that mediated uh, information from the simulation to the C2 systems, we looked at an approach called modeling and simulation as a service. And NATO has developed a framework for modeling and simulation as a service. And we used that framework to, to find out if someone could provide this functionality for us. And I'll talk to you about the MSAS concept a little bit as well. So the concept is quite straightforward. Modeling and simulation as a service is basically a function that is provided by one organization to another organization using the well-defined interfaces and uh, some level of agreements in terms of what is being exchanged. So basically, one organization takes on the responsibility of maintaining some, some capability that can provide a services or a function as a service through well-defined interfaces, also based on standards. And when we're combining a system or building or designing a system where we have elements of services, like uh, modeling simulation services, we do a composition. We compose all of those services together with our existing functionalities, our existing components, to create a federated system that includes modeling and simulation services. And in order to find those components and find those services, we need to go through some process. And it's the discovery of those services, the composition of those services, and then, of course, executing them in, in an execution environment that is suitable for the exercise. So we went through all of these steps uh, for the Viking exercise to try and identify these components and this functionality that allowed us to connect the simulation and C2 systems. The uh, NATO MSAS concept is basically an enterprise-level approach for, for this discovery, composition, and execution. 
And uh, there's a number of different roles defined in the MSES concepts. You have users and, and, and providers of services. Uh, you have uh, suppliers and consumers. So there's a different, different types of, of roles defined in the MSES concepts to support the discovery, composition, and execution phases. And there's processes and there's tools being developed in order to support this. Portals for discovery, uh, environments where you can compose your simulation services, and of course, uh, technology that is suitable for this type of service for executing them in cloud environments or other environments where you can, you can host those services. Uh, the AMSAS, of course, also poses a number of challenges, especially business model challenges. I'll talk to you about that a little bit later in this presentation. So when we went out to look for, for a solution for this problem of taking simulation data and moving the, some pieces of that into the C2 systems, we discovered two basic components that were readily available for us to use. And there were also providers of the services willing to provide this uh, functionality as a service, as an MSAS service. So we discovered a component called NATO Access. It's a NATO uh, component that takes uh, simulation data and produces different tactical data links, which we can then later use to stimulate the CETO system. And we discovered also components provided by the Dutch MOD that, that allowed us to do uh, uh, civil ship traffic uh, tracking and also do friendly force tracking type of stimulation to the CETO system based on simulation data. So we basically found two suppliers uh, the NCIA and TNL provides these uh, components, and we found providers of services willing to take those components, host them in their environment, and then provide the functionality to the Viking, uh, the rest of the Viking uh, solution. So the Joint Force Training Center in Bydgoszcz in Poland, the NATO JFTC, uh, uh, volunteered to host the NCIA, NCIA NATO Access System to allow us to produce this uh, stimulation to the sister systems, and also the Dutch MOD uh, hosts already the TNL supplied services uh, to produce AIS uh, traffic for the civil ships and also friendly force tracking. So we went through the process of having a dialogue with these uh, providers and of course also the service suppliers to make sure that uh, the, the functionality met the requirements we had on these components in terms of which standards to use and so forth. After discovering this, uh, we went into the phase of composition. So we're going to put them together with the rest of our components. And basically, in a, a little bit simplified view, we had our synthetic environment uh, and our CETO systems that we needed to stimulate. And we used the Axis system on a remote site in Bilgosz in Poland and uh, the Dutch MOD in Netherlands to, to provide us with this service using uh, this uh, identified or discovered software. So the synthetic environment provided simulation data, ground truth simulation data about the whereabouts of the units and the situation and also sensor modeling. And this information was ingested by the, these two uh, services and then uh, produced uh, tactical data links to stimulate the C2 system. So this is the basic approach. And we, of course, needed to make sure that this was reliable during the execution. And we have to sign service level agreements uh, between these different organizations in order to define, of course, the function itself, but also the availability and support that we require from these different organizations in providing support during the entire, not only the entire exercise, which ran over the weekend and, and, and strange hours, but also during the integration process and testing process. So we wrote up service level agreements based on this framework, the NATO framework for LA framework for modeling simulation as a service, which has defined templates for these types of service level agreements. So we wrote those between uh, uh, the Viking organization and JFTC, NATO JFTC, and NATO JFTC also had an agreement together with the, uh, the Dutch MOD in order to, to satisfy, satisfy all the requirements that we had for this functionality. Uh, this is the first time we are, we are writing this type of service level agreements and uh, for, for supporting an exercise. 
and it's the first time we're using the MCES concept in the Viking exercise. So we had also backup solutions for this functionality just to make sure that we, we could manage situations where the connectivity to the res these remote sites were not stable or reliable. This is the resulting design, uh, very uh, high level. Uh, we had a number of simulators participating in a federated system. We had Massa Sword, we had Pitch Actors, we had from Brazil Combatao also joining in from a remote site. We had the NATO ITC for the air, uh, air domain. And we had a number of services to do blue force tracking and sensor simulation and managing the scenario itself. And then, of course, we had the C2 systems, we had the CITAB HQ, and we had NATO ICC for the air domain. And as you can see, we are uh, taking simulation data output from the synthetic environment into the MSAS uh, sites and then getting technical data links back. And we used OTH Gold, NFFI, AIS, and perhaps something else. All right. Yeah. Uh, now I will uh, hand over to Enrico, who will talk about specifically two of these components, the Combater and the Massa Sword components that we used in this exercise. So I'll hand over to you. Uh, thank you, Bjorn. So, uh, SWORD, uh, the simulation used on two sites during the Viking exercise, is today used in more than 25 countries. You can see them here. The experience with Brazil and Sweden during Viking has again assured us that uh, supporting standards is very important. And thanks to those, we could provide an efficient way to execute SWORD in an MSAS environment. Uh, I say assured, uh, as we already in the past have been active in this area, and uh, that's what has been involved in several international exercises and standard working groups in the past. For instance, uh, CWIX, uh, uh, the CBML, and the C2SIM standards. For sure, we still have lots of challenges to streamline the usage and the processes, but in general, uh, we have come far already. So, how is SWORD used? The main usage of SWORD is to provide a realistic simulated environment when performing exercises for higher level decision makers. So, as an example, uh, it could be for a crisis cell or uh, for, a, like in Viking here, uh, a defense headquarter. SWORD is also used by several defense organizations or system integrators for operational research. Uh, a very interesting ac application we foresee for the future is to provide a decision-making tool for the headquarter in the wargaming process throughout operations. To simulate fast and real-time different courses of action and provide decision-makers detailed information about potential weak spots in their plans. For instance, uh, is the force ratio balanced over the entire field during the operation? Or will the logistics be able to support the advancement of the brigade. So SWORD is an aggregated constructive simulation. So that means that we're simulating units containing the crew and their equipment. The Massa AI engine, direct AI, is used to control uh, units by giving them operational missions that they then execute independently according to doctrine. They do that in an opportunistic manner taking into consideration the environment and the relation to the enemies. SWORD has AI on two levels, uh, AI on the commanding agent level that coordinates its subordinates and AI on the agent level. SWORD is a complete simulation solution that includes a vast library of default content and all the tools uh, that is needed to adapt this content and, or create new ones. SWORD is really easy to use. A super user is trained in maximum two weeks. And the user supposed to operate SWORD can be trained in a few hours or a few days, depending on the job he's supposed to do. SWORD is interoperable, as I mentioned already before, supporting several industry standards, as HLA, DIS, MSDL, CBML, and C2SIM. SWORD is also provided with a, a documented network API that can be used to develop integrations to other systems or to develop support for other standards. The vast group of users, the constant evolution with two major releases per year, the open architecture with support for standards, makes SWORD a future-proof 
and cost-efficient solution for our users. I did earlier in this slide, uh, you did earlier in this slide see this uh, similar slide uh, that Björn showed, and uh, the two sites where SWORD was used are the SWORD land and the SWORD combat land items. So from Brazil was simulated the UN Sector 2 Brigade, and from Sweden, the second NATO Brigade. Uh, Kotor uh, means Terrestrial Operations Command in Brazil, acquired SWORD in 2013 through a Brazilian system integrator. Uh, they adapted the default content to correspond to Brazilian units and doctrine. The modified version of SWORD they named Combatter, so it's SWORD actually behind there. And uh, France, here in France, the French army is naming SWORD as SULT. Please note that the adaptation is done in data sets that are separated from the simulation core. So the benefits of new releases of SWORD without having to redo the work. And the second half of 2014, uh, the Brazilians executed the first uh, shop exercise with uh, Combatter. Actually, uh, the Brazilians already were participating in Viking do 2018. Yeah, exactly. So in Sweden, they have been using SWORD since uh, 2020. Uh, the work that was done in preparation for Viking, of course, on top of the insertion into the environment that Bjorn talked about earlier, was to adapt the default content uh, creating the terrain from geodata and uh, creating the scenario to be used. Sorry. Uh, what's happening? Yeah, so this is the Sweden slide. So you can see how SWORD was used during Viking. The two communication means uh, with SWORD that was used during Viking is as you've seen earlier in the presentation, HLA and the, the SWORD C-Tower Gateway. During Viking, HLA was used to transfer and receive units, positions and states. And the Gateway was used for Blue Forces tracking and to transfer intel about uh, Red Forces. One of the challenges we had during Viking was actually the fact that both HLA and the Gateway were sending information to uh, the C2 system that was used during the exercise. And this was done at the same time. So it had to be clarified what information that was to be sent to CTOWER from the SWORD simulation system about friendly units and also enemy units. And, sorry. With regards to the CTOWER gateway, uh, we also did a few adaptations, and uh, these adaptations are no part of the gateway as we provide it. And uh, they can be activated or deactivated depending on uh, the specific needs for, for the different users. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Enrico. So, Enrico represents uh, Massa Group and was one of the suppliers for, for this exercise. And uh, who were the others? Let's see what happened here. Next slide. Yes. So the uh, stakeholders uh, for this exercise, uh, Peter represents the Swedish Armed Forces, at the end users that put out the requirements, the training objectives. The customer in this case is the Swedish Defense Procurement Agency, FMV, uh, that procured and, and managed the integration of all of these components and delivered the solution to the Swedish Armed Forces. Uh, together with the integration partner and all the different providers uh, are uh, part of this uh, set of uh, or provides the, dif the dif dif set of tools but only some of them are provided as a service so uh, in this case it's the ncia as a supplier uh, collaborating with the joint force training center providing services tno with the kicks or the dutch mod providing services the other components like the massa sword uh, the pitch tools, systematic, and 4C, which represents the C2 systems and all the other systems that we used in this environment, were already existing suppliers to the Swedish Armed Forces. So, 
Next slide. Yes. So I'll talk to you a little bit from a customer perspective or the FMV procurement agency perspective uh, about the challenges for MSAS as we see it. Uh, first of all, it's a cultural change in looking at how we procure this type of capability. Instead of buying a simulation software or simulation components or any other software, we are kind of renting it or we are establishing an agreement with respect to, to, to uh, procure a service rather than a product. So this is a cultural change for the procurement agency which has, uh, needs to learn how to procure services in this way and how to manage all the risks associated with, uh, uh, with, with having a service provider instead of, of integrating this component yourself. Uh, so there is a lot of uh, different opportunities, of course, related to this as well, allowing you to do uh, uh, paper use and other arrangements when it comes to, to the uh, payment of these services. It's also a question about the maturity of uh, MSAS itself and how well established it is in the, in the, uh, among the different organizations that are potentially capable of providing services. This is a new concept and we struggle, struggle a little bit with both our service providers because this is the first time for them as well. So uh, this exercise was the first for, for both the user customer and the different uh, providers. But it's also a learning experience and we have a lot of feedback uh, to, to the uh, development or further development of this framework for modeling simulation as a service. Ensuring SLA compliance uh, is also difficult. Uh, we have to find the processes and the tools necessary in order to do test and verification of these services uh, before getting to the actual exercise. So we, we need to be able to have access to these services long before and the actual execution. And especially since some of this maturity uh, was uh, kind of lacking for some of these components, we really needed to test everything uh, a lot before actually going to the exercise. Another uh, interesting area of, of our challenge is service management and control. How do we manage and control all of these services? Do we call up the, uh, this, the support officer on the remote site or do we have ac our control ourselves? in starting and stopping these services. So the different levels of simulation, service management and control is something that we require for future uh, use of MSAS. And the final bullet here is cross-domain security. Since these services were provided from remote sites, we had to implement a cross-domain security solution to protect the rest of the Viking system uh, just to be able to get uh, the system accredited. So we did deploy a cross-domain security solution for this environment to protect uh, the, uh, the, Viking, the rest of the Viking system uh, from the systems provided by the uh, different service providers. Let's see. But of course there are benefits. As I mentioned, uh, the, the, this alternative business model allows the, the customer to buy this on a tempor more temporary basis and also uh, do not have as much cost related to the maintenance of these systems. Uh, so we are expecting the service providers through the well-defined interfaces to be replaceable also for the future. Uh, but that of course requires that the maturity and, and the uh, acceptance of this concept is, is much higher. We need more service providers, we need more sur suppliers of tools that comply with the standards. Potentially reduced cost of ownership, uh, especially as I said, the maintenance costs of making sure that this is up and running on a daily basis. And then of course, uh, it allowed us to have more easy access or more on-demand access to these services. We can, we can fire up these services quite easily, a little bit different for the different providers, but quite easily, and we could also expand. We could have a scalability and elasticity by uh, starting multiple instances of these services to extend the architecture with additional um, uh, feeds to the C2 system. So just to briefly mention the cross-domain security solution without going into details because most of this is not, not something I can present here. But basically we did filtering and protocol break uh, to make sure that the simulation data uh, is only released according to a specific policy. So we wrote policies for exporting and importing data and we did apply both filtering mechanisms and then of course uh, policing with security devices and logging and all of that stuff. 
but most importantly, we did a protocol break, which is ins inspectable uh, by hardware devices. And also, the, of course, there's a lot of networking involved as well. And this is, was only to protect the, uh, the Swedish site and the, uh, the systems that we had on the Swedish site, the synthetic environment, the C2 systems. And then similar uh, mechanisms and capabilities were implemented at uh, the Joint Force Training Center in, in Brazil and in the Netherlands. So they handled their part of the security solution. This is the final uh, slide for me today, and then I'll hand over back to, to Peter. This is actually the the full set of services that were involved. I don't expect you to read this. Uh, but what is interesting is that everything in yellow and orange are the services that were provided by GFTC and the Dutch MOD. The blue parts are all things that are running uh, as our core simulation in Sweden, and the green part on the bottom left is the Brazilians. And the light blue is actually a backup solution for the yellow part. So we didn't really trust all everything with MCS for this, this first time. So we did actually implement a backup solution if the connection to the remote sites and the service providers were not uh, up and running, we could switch to plan B and run and stimulate the C2 systems anyway. So we did have a backup solution, which is a little bit limited, but uh, we were able to run uh, using the MSS services as expected. So I'll hand over back to Peter from an uh, end user perspective and his lessons le identified. Okay, thank you. And uh, FAV, thank you for the um, delivery of the solution. And, and so now we have conducted the exercise with that solution. And, and it was, uh, now we're gonna talk about the lessons identified here. Yes, next one. So, um, it was really neat that we could use the other uh, organizations manpower and, the, and that we have access to new personnel types. SMEs, as a subject matter expert, we didn't need to foster themselves. It comes with the service, the, the, the manpower. Also, uh, for the support and fault handling, we got more people that could help us out here when we did lots of fault handling and the, for the integration work. So we didn't need to have them in our organization. We outsource all these kind of uh, issues in the MSS environment. So it was really also convenient that we could use NATO as a supplier and provider, and they were responsible for the NATO quality. So we, we, we arranged that by the SLA, and they took care of the quality on their side. Else I need to have all these kind of issues in my knee, but now I can all outsource them to NATO. And also, the computer resources. I didn't, I didn't need to buy all my infrastructure. NATO got it, MOD got it, Brazil got it. Else we need to have it in our sites. So now I also really, really outsource that. And that was really a good perspective for, from uh, MSAS. Okay, so things that we need to consider for next time. Um, um, first, the first one. We were really, uh, this was really the first time we used MSAS, and the services that we used perhaps wasn't so mature enough. They were really prototypes. So, so we, we, we did, did put lots of focus in trying to get the quality up on the respective service. So it really needs to, the quality of the composition is, is depending on the, on the quality of the participating services on its own. So all services together the result is the composition, quality of the composition. So stay very focused on the composed quality. Perhaps we should take away one of the ser small services because it's destroying the composition. So stay focused on what's the outcome of MSAS. And we had some network issues in the beginning. Uh, it, was, it was lots of issues with the network. It went down, down, up and down. So we, we turned over to plan B and back to plan A and back to B. And, but uh, after half an exercise, the network was stable and everything was running smoothly. And that's also ensuring the monitoring supervision. Bjorn talked about it. How can we supervise all these uh, services? That's from NATO. How can we access to their 
uh, command or uh, monitor tool. Uh, and another thing, IT security. Okay, no one would like to have this. Uh, uh, no one would like to have this system. There, everyone would like to have it in their domain because it's much easier to have control from an IT perspective. So when we are talking to the world via tunnels at the internet, that's really scary for the IT security guy. So they say, no, 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 never happen, never, never will happen. And we really were fighting for it and try to really, we have this cross domain solution. We really have to prove that we can trust the other sites and be sure that you really early in the process involve the IT security guys. Uh, so as I said, they have a redundancy plan, ensure collaboration tools, and how do you talk to the providers, how do you do fault handling. So it's really important that you have a build a good relationships with your provider and supplier so you know, so you know them. Okay, next. So the conclusions. It was really good stability in the MCS environment. The users didn't have no downtime. They really appeared a stable uh, environment. It was uh, the standards was really flexible, and uh, and uh, we think it's a federal solution. It's really a fundamental thing for the MCS, and ensure the quality of respective service before going into the composition part. And this making exercise is really perfect for doing experimentation. So we, this, this, we're not training real stars, we're training people. So it is really an experimental exercise also the liking. That's why we encourage every nation to bring their systems onto the exercise. So we together can develop new concepts and new, new ideas and, and new CACs. Uh, environments and you can uh, contribute to the tax involvement. Okay, and next one. So finally then, if we connect it back to the training objectives, so in Viking 22, we could feed the C2 systems as the basis for their uh, summer reports, and we think the training objectives was fulfilled. End of story. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions, you feel free to ask them. Uh, after this Q&A session part, uh, you're also welcome to visit the uh, simulation uh, pavilion over there, and you can get some demonstration of some of these Viking concepts, in both in the, uh, the, uh, the French MOD booth, but also in the booths surrounding that simulation pavilion. Uh, questions, yes. Thank you. For the next uh, Viking uh, exercise, do you think you will continue on uh, using MSAS solution? Yes, we really think this is the future. And we've been working in the MSAS working group in NATO as well, so we are contributing to develop the MSAS as well. So we really would like to have the Viking to prove that the MSAS is working. So this is the start for MSAS development for our part. So we're going we're gonna to have the MSAS in next week as well, as well. So the Viking has uh, been a driver for, for providing feedback to the NATO working groups for a long time, since, uh, since the start, basically 1999. Uh, so for every Viking, we're trying some new concept, and then we bring the experiences back to the NATO working groups. And this year, we tr tried the MSAS concept, and of course, we will bring that feedback uh, feedback, feedback back to, uh, to the native groups working on this concept to evolve that further and we're willing, as Peter said, to try it. Uh, but we are really hoping for more people to be able to provide services. Next question. No more questions? Do you have already uh, the date for the next session or the year? <laughs> Right, so uh, every Viking is conducted every three years, and uh, we haven't come up with a new date, so, but in the near time, usually at ITSEC, uh, we're going to release uh, when the next Viking will occur, and all the nations going to have an invite, and we also encourage people to come to the ITSEC and be on the startup uh, meeting there, and perhaps it might be 2025 next Viking. No one knows.
but uh, 2025 we can have it. Okay, any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Have a great uh, show and exhibition.